Hello, everyone, and welcome to In Conversation, a series exploring the makings of our exhibitions. In this case, we're talking about Deepfakes, Art Meets Double, an exhibition curated by lead curator and director, Professor Sarah Candidine at EPFL Pavilion's Amplifier for Arts, Science, and Society at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, EPFL Lausanne, an exhibition on view until May 1st, 2022. My name is Monica Antohi. I'm communications lead with EPFL Pavilions, and today I have the uh, I have with me Thierry Olivier and uh, oh, from mm -hmm. Digital Projections UK, and Alexander Kulik from Consensus. Uh, the two com companies responsible for the Abbey Saint Michel installation, one of the 21 installations in our uh, Deep Fake Darkness Double exhibition. But we are missing one person. So before I introduce you to Thierry and Alexander, um, I'd like to mention Martin Scheip, uh, um, archaeologist, which is um, he's also a CEO of Artron 3D. Um, he was actually uh, collaborating with the two of you to put together the exhibition, the, the installation that we're we're actually going to be discussing today, which is the Abbey Saint Michel uh, multi-spectral uh, viewer uh, installation we have uh, in in in, uh, in Lausanne. So welcome to Yuri and Alexander, and um, nice to have you guys. Thank you for inviting us. Thank Absolutely. you. Hi. Uh, hi, uh, both of you. Um, I know we're we're kind of getting um, uh, your you know, we're, we're kind of we're talking about something that uh, uh, has to, a lot to do with collaboration and and you guys. Uh, there's two companies involved. There's three companies involved in in this whole process of putting together something so magnificent as uh, as what we have here um, in the in this particular exhibit. But before we actually look at the exhibit, let's talk a little about what brought you into what you're doing. What are you doing with your specific companies and and uh, why is uh, why are we talking about? But what are we talking about today, basically? So, um, Alexander, you want to uh, take us through your a bit of your background and and what brought you into working with Consensus? Oh well, um, this is a long story. I try to make it short. So basically, by profession, I'm, I studied uh, I studied industrial design and. While doing it, I was f focusing mostly on tools. I'm interested in tools and I realized, well, um, modern tools are basically in, in, in some form a computer. Um, at least they contain a microchip and that's why I moved then over to, um, to study um, computer science and did my PhD in this field. Um, working primarily with Professor Bernd Fröhlich on the um, on VR systems, um, and we were always interested in um, enabling virtual reality systems for multiple users. Um, so basically, it's a visualization technology, and it should um, and it should facilitate communication and exchange um, about, say, professional aspects, but also, of course. Um, um, but also, of, co of course, um, it's just interesting, beautiful um, data that, that can be shown. And back then, VR glasses weren't so lightweight like those, you know, um, the, H the headset yeah. just became so popular and, 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 and usable. But back then, the only option to do proper VR with a good image quality was to use projection. And projection mm. never supported multiple users. Uh, so this was so you had large screens, <laughs> um, but you never had um, multiple. You even had multiple people standing in front of them, but they didn't yes. got their own perspective. This is where we started uh, with digital image to um, develop multi, um, which is a company in Germany, digital image with uh, Armin Sink, and we we looked into developing. Um, projection technology that supports uh, multiple users and now digital projection jumped into the game and they are they are producing um, this technology so all of a sudden we have projectors that show um, perspectively correct 3d images for um, for up to six users and we stand in front of a large window if you want so and look at uh, at high resolution 3d data and this really formed the basis for um my phd that was then looking up on how do people cooperate in such systems how do people work together and what's necessary that's spectacular and there's a lot of to unpack there and we'll have a lot of video to to look at um a little bit later on for especially for the mm -hmm. for the um the multi-u uh, viewer 
perspective um because that's super fascinating because it's 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 so uh groundbreaking um the the multi-viewer high definition your own perspective um, um uh, view um so before we get to those videos uh Thierry, you want to walk us uh, through hello first of all hello. um <laughs> hello so my, my background is is less scientific and typical uh let's say B business education, uh, basically MBA from University of Stirling in Scotland. Hello, Scotland. And uh, worked in, I was co-founder of uh, companies in the, the field of projection, basically, here in Norway, where I'm based. Uh, and uh, over the years, I worked with uh, several companies and, and export and was always fascinating about about VR from and from two things VR and also visual arts basically that's been the two components that probably uh, uh, led me uh, led me to to be on this uh, on this uh, today on, on this call with you uh, and uh, I found when I met digital projection that uh, I found a lot of the spirit and the interest for these subjects beyond just uh, being a manufacturer, there are really uh, great people who, uh, who care about uh, how to apply technology to, to other fields. And that, that uh, interests me. So I worked in business development with that. And previously, I did some work for Volfoni, which is a, a, a maker of, uh, of uh, 3D glasses, which we are going to talk about because they are actually used in, in, this, in this project. So basically, yeah, it's about uh, audiovisual industries. Uh, more from a commercial perspective initially and an interest for visual uh, arts and VR that led me to, to this. Yeah, but you're also the glue that brought everybody together. Yeah, I'm kind of the glue because uh, th through the years I got to, to know uh, Professor uh, Sarkander and I was fascinated about uh, the fact that she's an artist uh, in my view, she's an artist. She has an understanding of the world of, of art and the world of, of museum, but she also has a, a deep understanding about technology. And that's, Absolutely. I would say, this is becoming more common now, but I would say 15 years ago, it wasn't actually. That's quite unique. And uh, as we uh, engaged around what could we do with this new uh, multi-view uh, concept that digital projection was bringing to the market, I actually uh, thought quite quickly about uh, Alexander uh, Kulik because through digital projection, uh, I got to understand the work that he and his colleagues were doing at the, uh, at the Bauhaus University in Weimar. Yeah. And uh, I was quite fascinated about that. And I would say he has probably the, the complementary approach to, to mine. He's coming more from the scientific uh, yeah. uh, background, I would say understanding technology uh, and and uh, and also having an interest, I guess, for arts uh, as well, but more more out of a scientific uh, side. So actually, I I put them in touch, uh, and uh, I wouldn't say it was love at first sight, but close to. I think they really uh, uh, understood each other very quickly. Uh, Sarah made the effort to go to Weimar at a time where. Uh, we were in COVID time, so actually things were quite complicated, but a uh, face-to-face -face meeting was, was necessary at some point, and she came to visit you. So I think uh, from then on, I understood things uh, were, were, were going to fly, actually. So yes, I was kind of the glue. The, the glue that brought it all together, and um, uh, Sarah's uh, vision kind of helped put the whole, uh, you know, installation together, but none of that would be possible without the scans that Artron was, was taking, right? So um, how did that come about? Like, um, because we don't have Martin here, unfortunately, um, he's on a dig somewhere. Um, you know, that's the, that's what happens when you're an archeologist. <laughs> um, so unfortunately he's not here with us, but um, how did he come into the conversation? How, um, how did that come about, Alexander? Yeah, um, thanks for asking. Um, Martin really is a pioneer in his field. I consider him um, 20 years or 25 years ago, he, when he finished his uh, education as an archaeologist and he was uh, doing a lot of digs and he realized that actually drawing uh, each and every layer while digging is not the most efficient thing and also doesn't capture what, what really is in, in the ground. 
So um, he started um, to use digital technologies and um, and to do scans and uh, founded a company, Arctron 3D, um, to do this on a professional level. And still, um, while now there are more and more companies uh, popping up that that deliver or that offer similar services. Um, the experience that they have in um, capturing and also processing the data because it also mm -hmm. involves a lot of manual processing actually if you want to um, get rid of all the noise involved and so on um, it requires a lot of experience and um, and also an understanding of what you're actually showing um, what you're looking at and yeah Yes, and, and and so Arctron is very unique in that field. So we met, um, I don't know, many years ago, like 10 years ago or something like that on, on, a, on a fair where we were presenting some input technology for uh, VR systems and he was coming by, he was just interested and we realized that what they were doing, they were capturing um, back then already um, high resolution digital twins of um, of historical buildings and historical um, art objects and um, and this was very interesting data to look at um, which also in a which was um, uh, it, it, and and it kind of required our technology um, our visualization technology because all of a sudden you can look at the data at much higher detail uh, than you can in mm -hmm. reality also often the data the the, the objects are placed somewhere where, where you cannot re simply reach right. now right. um arctron was capturing the data and we saw the scientific challenge how to display this in in vr systems in real time and so that's at the time at that time we then started a european project where we were capturing um uh, rock art in italy the pitotti in the uh, in the um, val camonica in the valley of the camuni and um and arctron was already then delivering quite impressive data very high resolution scans of these engravings in the rock and we could present them on our uh, on our displays uh, which was uh, using our systems and this is where we started then to develop um, our own technologies for managing these large mm -hmm. um, these la large data sets and from then on basically martin and us uh, or arcron and us um, back then uh, as a university now as a company we were we since then we are working quite closely together they deliver very nice data we deliver systems that are able to to show them in real time and um and to, to uh, yeah to, to make them accessible for more and more people mm, so talking about accessibility um can we show the video from uh our install our uh the installation in our exhibition so we can sure. talk about that let's do that so we're in our <laughs> we're in our space. Um, what are we looking at? We are looking at the uh, Saint Kunigunde. Um, mm -hmm. It's it's one of the sculptures in the um, in, in the Church of Saint Michael. Again, like they they scanned the whole they, or they captured the whole um, the whole church, the whole interior but um some of the figures were captured at particular high uh, resolution and now we are looking at it from a monoscopic perspective so mm -hmm. the system has been adapted to show only one uh, one particular view um however uh, you you can see that adam is wearing these glasses there yeah um which means that he sees the data from his perspective and it's shown um to the camera from another perspective and um, and and that makes it so interesting because this allows us to 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 look at the data together and um, and to discuss it. Um, yeah, this is well, this is my my favorite piece. <laughs> this the is Saint piece. Michael defeating the devil. <laughs> yes. This this is made of wood, um, and it's plated with gold and stuff. Uh, it's, it's impressive, really. Uh, um, the pulpit of Saint Michael. And all, all we see here is, um, in fact, like about five meter high. So even if you visit uh, the church, you never see this, um, or you hardly see yeah. this. Um, and this is, um, like I tend to say, 
um, back then in the Rococo time, um, the artists made it for the Holy Ghost himself. Uh, it was sufficient because you know, <laughs> if the Holy Ghost appreciates, yeah. it's 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 good enough. Um, but see, now, see, uh, Alexander, if I can jump in, I think yeah. uh, it suddenly come to my mind that the deep fakes, uh, the the name of of this uh, whole exhibition, uh, uh, is very well described here because by zooming in, by going to that level of detail, this is yeah. really a depth that. Uh, you don't even get even with your own eyes if you could get there and that's uh, that's that notion of depth which is quite quite unique um the, the this is a virtual representation of of uh, what we what exists in the bamberg cathedral um and it's but we, as a visitor you'll never be able to see this <clears throat> Um, it is what it is. It's it's a, it's a true representation, true digital representation of it. But we wouldn't be able to see this. So um, with the naked eye. So sorry, Alexander, keep going. Yeah, basically that's it. By the way, it, it looks much too red here for whatever reason. It's not that reddish. Uh, the data. Um, this is probably uh, related to the to the capturing method. <clears throat> but anyway. Um, Really, the combination of, of, of capturing the um, the interior of such mm -hmm. historical buildings at such high high level of detail, yeah. um, the possibility to process the data in real time, to be able to to show it on then such high resolution, high end display technology as digital projection is developing it here, is currently unique, um, and it's this is. Um, we will later talk about also about these devices, you know, um, that we are using more and more, and we try to deliver something similar. Um, but I still believe, um, you know, the most important thing is, or the most important thing what we need is when we when we want to appreciate something, is we need to have the time and the attention. And uh, and then we need um, when we spend the time and the attention, then we need the quality. Um, this right. is where we talk about, um, say, educational events, maybe where, uh, um, where, where where these things are shown. And and it's, I believe, it's not only about technology to um, to 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 achieve accessibility. But it's primarily about um, creating these events that make, um, you know, that that create the attention or that that mm. enable to create this attention. And this is where I think museums have have still their role. So we can make everything virtual and basically everything. In the, and we are also working on this vision to to make things accessible technically everywhere and yes. at every time. At, um, but um, but again, um, to really appreciate this, these things and to learn something about the data, you need um, like you need the quality of presentation. You need right. um, a quality of also didactic content. Um, you need the possibility to exchange with experts on on what you're seeing, mm -hmm. and all of this requires um, to uh, re require social events. So basically, uh, the appreciation of art and, um, and, and, and history is, is much more about social exchange than it is about uh, mere technology. Um, but technology kind of facilitates that. Um, it's much easier to, to, to understand a, a part of history, to understand uh, a, a t like a space time uh, in a particular um, um, era um, if you have uh, 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 this kind of experience, you know, a VR kind of experience, because it's all encompassing, it's your point of view, it's, it's, it, it, it helps facilitate understanding um, for, for, the, for the regular person. But um, when we're talking about a huge amount of data, um, do you want to look at a bit of, at, at the Arctrine uh, video so we can talk about how they um, collated all of this data, um, how that came about and, um, you know, like specifically, what are they doing here? What are they, what are we, what are we looking at? Um, how yeah. do they accomplish this? So basically, what we what we see here is uh, still um, like real world uh, uh, 
photo uh, photo footage or video footage from the cathedral or from uh, from uh, from the church but this is already virtual so basically this is already a part of the uh, of, of of their reconstruction so what they did they went to uh, to bamberg and captured everything in extreme high resolution so they used a combination of laser scanning and photogrammetry um, yes. to combine both, um, say, geometric accuracy that you get from laser scanning and, uh, mm -hmm. and, and surface precision and surface detail that you get from photogrammetry. And here we see the Autotomba, for example, um, captured at extreme high uh, resolution. And so uh, we have a lot of this data really at sub-millimeter accuracy. And wow. uh, you can imagine that uh, doesn't really fit into um, into the memory of a of a common G of, of a com <laughs> common graphics Computer. card. Yes. And even and even if you even if you have it in your memory, um, because you have one of these high end gaming cards, and somehow mm -hmm. at least one of these figures fits. Um, even if you manage to fit it in, um, then you have extreme uh, an extreme amount of um, pixels and uh, and triangles that need to be um, touched to create the proper perspective. And and this is where we where we come in basically. We're talking about um, the projection is is 4K at 360 frames per second. Um, is that is that correct? That, that's that correct. sounds like insane uh, amount yeah, of data. That's great. I think this is all the work that now uh, Alexander is showing and with Actron uh, would be a kind of useless if you could not display it in a in a fair resolution. And the native 4K is what the satellite MLS 4K uh, HFR 360 uh, allows to show. That's basically today the highest resolution that you can find in. Uh, in uh, cinemas, you know, in, in digital cinemas. So it's some of the best you, you can do today. And that helps getting the, the precision uh, level. Beside the fact that it's on a projector that's extremely uh, powerful in terms of, uh, of, uh, of uh, brightness. Uh, yeah. And that's also very important because when you are using, uh, you are displaying in, in, in 3D for virtual, uh, reality you're basically using uh, two times 60 hertz so 120 hertz per uh, viewer and uh, in this concept you can have three viewers which is why it's called multi-view but basically mm -hmm. all of this is eating a lot of light actually so you need to yeah. have a very bright projector uh, in order to do that if we were using that same projector uh, I, I would say, and basically not in 3D, but in 2D, that would be enough to do the mapping of the front of the church uh, wow. mapping experience in 2D. So this is basically yeah. the amount of light that we are using, which is in a way channeled uh, to, to give so much uh, uh, brightness for each of the viewers. But in actual terms, you could use that same projector for mapping on a large building, and uh, that would create the show. So uh, we, uh, looking back at, at digital projection in that regard, I would say it's always be a, a quite innovative company. Um, I, uh, I joined actually uh, two, three years ago, uh, uh, digital projection, and I realized that, which I didn't know, that they were uh, associated to Texas Instrument to create the DLP technology in the very early days. Today, most people don't know about it, but they were actually uh, one of the absolutely first one to think how to use uh, uh, micro chips uh, in order to create uh, image and imaging technology. So, so when I talk about DLP, I'm talking about a component which I don't have here, but which is a, a component uh, electronic where basically you have million of mirrors who are sitting on a chip which has the side of a, a thumbnail. So millions of okay. mirrors that are constantly moving. Uh, and basically, because they are mirrors, they're made of glass, meaning they're made of sand, uh, in essence. And that's yeah. fascinating. And all these mirrors are all moving in order to uh, pass on the, the correct amount of light for each of, to create each of the pixels that will be on the image. So wow. again, about uh, when you go deep into things, you realize that even in technology, there is, if not art, at least this is this is fascinating. There are millions of mirrors who are constantly 
creating uh, adjusting. Yeah, adjusting. So uh, uh, digital projection was was part of that, and uh, some of the work that is now uh, showing uh, in terms of product uh, for the digital projection was to actually create a 8K projector. That's an even higher resolution than the 4K we are using, which will come is already on the market, but it's very early stage. But in order to feed in uh, 8K re native resolution, which is four times 4K, which is 16 times HD, you basically need a lot of processing power. And one of the uh, benefits that digital projection R&D team found is that with all that capacity, why don't we use that for instead of one 8K, but to use it for a 4K, but for three users, each of them uh, using 120 hertz, meaning two, two times 60 hertz, one for each eye. And that's how the idea of uh, multi-view uh, came with the, mm -hmm. the help very early of uh, Alexander and his colleagues at Weimar, who basically saw for their work a uh, uh, good use of that technology. So that actually that, that multi-view was... Uh, developed very much uh, together with the, with the Weimar uh, team. And uh, mm -hmm. that's, that, that is what we're going to focus and look at more, more in details, how it works. But what is unique at, at uh, DeepFakes is that the, um, this is the multi-view HFR360 is, uh, is brand new to the market, but the satellite MLS, which is the projector, the projector, right. so, the projector solution that's being used is also uh, new. And the combination of both uh, was never used before, was never shown to the general public. So for those who haven't been there yet, it's a great opportunity Do it quickly. to look at it <laughs> because you are talking of many hundred thousand euros of, of equipment altogether, which you can experience as, as public, which normally uh, you don't because it's reserved to, to labs or, or uh, some right. of the leading Designed industry the uh, in, yeah, mm -hmm. in CAD design and so on so, so far. And, and the combination of both is interesting because what the satellite MLS is to create all that amount of light I talked about using laser illumination, the version we had before, uh, the one we presented at DeepFakes, was basically a projector that weights 125 kilos. Oh, yeah, it's got its own room. Yes, um. yes, that's that's basically what it <laughs> it's, takes. It's got its own secure room. room. <laughs> and what the satellite MLS offers is that uh, the idea has been to decouple the laser illumination, the, the mm -hmm. light source from the projection head where the optic is attached and the electronic and that DMD I refer to is sitting. And all that is normally in one body, but that body is a big one. It's 125 kilos. What we have now is basically the head can be as low as 20 kilos and you can decouple it from the laser illumination, which sits in a rack, which is what is happening in Lausanne, so that you can get all of the, uh, the heat and the noise that it emits mm -hmm. away from where the projection takes place. And that's mm -hmm. particularly interesting in museums, where basically uh, you, you don't want technology to, to show. It should be almost... Uh, invisible or it will be very interesting and many of the requests we have now for the satellite mls come from historical buildings or or let's say noise sensitive or yeah. radiation sensitive environment very much operas uh, mm. uh, um, uh, we are operas are currently uh, many of them are, are getting in touch because they have no tolerance for for noise logically uh, or they are considering to put on stage a large projection, but that's not possible if you want to hang something that big uh, above uh, the artist, uh, and it will yeah. be disturbing anyway. So now some scenographs uh, are finding ways to actually incorporate just the head uh, on stage, and the rest of the projection uh, is somewhere under on the separate side. Because what I haven't said is that when you decouple, you can actually, right now, it can be 30 meters distance between most of the projector and the projector head. And in the mm -hmm. future, we believe we'll get to 100 meters. So you can really put all the illumination in a on racks in a different part of the building and distribute uh, the amount of light that, that you want. So, so it's 
the combination of that satellite MLS uh, with the uh, uh, multi-view HFR 360 that makes uh, uh, the deepfakes uh, installation absolutely uh, for, for world first. Maybe we should present uh, uh, the satellite uh, MLS uh, as a, a short video, the concept. Let's do that. Basically, if I could um, add to this, um, that I, I very much, I'm very glad about the cooperation with digital projection, but I also need to, or I'd like to stress how this came all about and what really digital projection is 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 adding here. So when we started looking at um, multi-view. Um, that, that multi-view technology actually it takes it, it, it dates back to 1997, I think, when uh, Professor Bernd Fröhlich, um, back then in Stanford, he used um, CRT um, cathode ray um, um, projector projectors, who could back then already run at I think 144 hertz. Mm -hmm. um, Small image, of course, not much, high, not much resolution, and especially almost no light. Um, <laughs> and he was realizing the first um, what, what what they called the responsive workbench. It was already a tabletop. Um, so the first um, multi-view installation, if you want, so was uh, was a tabletop, and it um, and it was enabled by this um, cut by this CRT projector. And it was very slow, so the image was flickering. It was very low resolution, and it was also very dark. But uh, Bernd back then already had this vision. He understood what that could become at some point. And we then, when when I joined his team, I think in 2002, 2001, 2002, something like that. Then we started to 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 um, to experiment with shutters. Um, we built mechanical shutters, like really large um, wheels that were turning, and 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 stuff like this uh, to, to simply um, hide a projection for some time to be able to show the image from another perspective, from, from another projector at the same time. And that's the whole um, idea behind it. You show images from one graphics card that goes through one projector to one person, and then you show the other. And if you do that fast enough, people won't recognize that we show them sequen sequentially, but they will perceive it as uh, simultaneously. And all of a sudden you have these six to 12 images of the uh, on the screen and um, three to six people can experience um, the scenery from their own stereoscopic uh, correct um, viewpoint. And okay, now, that's uh, a huge thing, right? The stereoscopic part, right? Yeah. So, yes. because, so yeah. I mean, there, there has been three D three D cinema. There was a huge hype, I think, in two thousand six, two thousand five, oh, yeah. something like that. Avatar and was the, the Avatar oh, was yeah. the movie. <laughs> They, they still do movies in 3D, and I still love them. They're still gorgeous. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they are, but they are good typically from one perspective. 
Um, yes. so there's a sweet spot from which it all looks good. For the others, they are considered, well, we shouldn't do too much parallax because otherwise it doesn't work. But if you really want things to, to pop out of the screen, then you need to, or to be really, to, to have really depth into, you need to consider that the distance between your two eyes is much, yeah. much less than the distance to your neighbor. Yeah. So if you show 3D, okay. you know, you show 3D images, which considers that there is a distance between the both eyes. So you show different images for left and right eye, but you yeah. you you shouldn't then um, ignore <laughs> that everybody else has a different perspective and that these distances are much larger. And that this is why we we're so interested in. Uh, building multi-view technology, providing individual uh, head-tracked uh, perspectives, so you could walk around the data, and we and, and we've continued to to build that with uh, with optical shutters. We had in 2005, I think, a four-user system, where we basically stacked LCD projectors and um, and and put LC shutters in front of each. Guess what happened with all the light? It was burned, so we just um, so we just made heat out of it um, by putting these shutters and you know blacking blackening them out. So this wasn't very smart, but it was the only option that we had then. Um, then we met Armin Zink. I really need to um, to refer to him because in, for this whole history, none of that would have happened without Armin Zink. He is genius if it comes to touching technology. And he is he isn't afraid of anything. That's also I think that's a particular um trait that he has. Um so when we were talking to him, see couldn't we do something to increase uh, the the the, the uh, say the dart data input into a DLP because it was clear back then that the DLP would be fast enough. And it was clear this would be fast enough. So it could like the, the the mirrors are fast enough so they could show like these six to um these these six images one after another at a 60 hertz frame. Um but it wasn't clear how would we get the data on the chip. Um Armin then basically wrapped uh, uh so he opened I think three projectors from um from from another company and he I, I think uh, we're Alexander, that's what you don't know is that I'm actually the guy who made it possible because of Armin Zink. That's why it was so nice when you mentioned his name. And I haven't been in touch for a long time. As you said, nothing stops him. And he came yeah. <laughs> and said, basically, I'm going to be using with one single DMD, uh, DMD chip an electronic that's so powerful that I will feed for each eye. And, and we kind of said, no, that's not really possible from what Texas Instruments is saying. But no, wouldn't stop him. He did it actually. So we mm -hmm. created the projection design F1 AS3D. I don't know if you remember. That's probably the one you refer. Yeah, yeah. And basically, uh, it worked. And that's typical. That's exactly uh, Doctor Singh. Yeah, nothing stops him, and it worked. We didn't sell as many as he wanted. I have to tell you on the commercial side, but uh, uh, but really, it was a breakthrough. He managed to uh, to go to to see how to uh, optimize the use of whatever technology was available. Yeah. And actually, this brings me back to the satellite MLS that now, I mean, mm -hmm. it, 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 this, the prototypes that we that then had weren't extremely robust, imagine. I mean, you know, there were just cables hanging out and everything needed to be resoldered every now and then, which took me quite some time. Um, but and also the image quality wasn't that so there was noise because the the transmission quality wasn't perfect and the, the colors weren't perfect and 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 so on and so on mm -hmm. but still um we were most interested let's build a tabletop which was built with a prototype from uh, armin sink this so one this is the really... so this is the um the tabletop that you're talking about yeah exactly we really believe, like if you if you think about multi-view, then um, it's more, most important for a tabletop where everybody has a completely different perspective on the on 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 the screen. And um, this is only a short video, unfortunately, but we, of course we also combine it with um, with the large screen. Anyway, in, <clears throat> enabling such a tabletop. Um, is very difficult and it was first realized here with a prototype from Armin and um, what you know 
it looks okay on the video, but it wasn't so so easy to to get this running. Now with the mm -hmm. satellite MLS, all of a the sudden there is a device uh, which is small enough, powerful enough, high resolution enough to make this really uh, a product which I force you in the future. Um, also in this combination, particularly it's nice. We we also have such a such a projection in in, in Lausanne, right? But the combination with the tabletop is really nice because all of a sudden you don't need to navigate, but you search something on a tabletop and then you bring it over. And by the way, these are these are the Pitotti. Um, these mm -hmm. are you were talking about earlier, the ones that you were studying. Right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. These are the the Pitotti figures uh, from the Valley of the Camuni, which were also captured by 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 Martin. This figure, for example, that you see here, like almost um, man size, is the size of a hand, and we can go down to the individual picks, um, like, you know, where the, the our ancestors, like, I think 5,000 years ago, like, packed them into the stone. Now we can appreciate this um, virtually very nice. This is a different work, also interesting, but maybe, um, yeah, here the idea is we should be able to to compare what we have as a reconstruction always to the, um, to the original image footage. Um, mm, but this is really something. What is, something. Maybe what is Alex, holding? we could describe uh, if you can freeze the image. Maybe Monica, mm -hmm. uh, maybe de describe to uh, to viewers who are not so much into to 3D. What are those uh, strange-looking glasses, basically? That uh, <laughs> and yeah, the instrument, the handheld instrument. What is yeah. that thing? Yeah, yeah. So it's like a satellite <laughs> antenna from the 60s cartoons. Okay, so the whole technology is very much about fakes, right? It's it's deep fakes. So what we are doing here. So um, the the Feuchtmeier statue, which has also been captured by by Arctron, that we see here, isn't really there. It has been captured as a digital twin by Arctron, but we want to perceive it as if it would be there, and then we want to interact with it. Um, but since it isn't there, we cannot really touch it. So what do we do? First of all, we need to make sure that everybody perceives the figure from his or her own perspective. That's why we have this multi-view technology, but it doesn't suffice to, um, to, um, to be able to show different images. We also need to be able to separate them again because we show them all on the same screen. And then we put on these glasses that are sequentially switching. So they are um, black or transparent at a certain time. So they are only transparent whenever your image is shown. Now mm -hmm. we can show for everybody involved an individual image. Now we need to know where this, pre where this person is to, to, to compute the correct perspective. Mm -hmm. And to do this, um, the glasses or the people need to be tracked. And that's why they have these funny looking antennas. Um, these are yeah. basically retro reflective uh, markers that are seen by an array of cameras and they kept uh, they, uh, uh, yeah, and they track the positions. And we do the same with the input device. So all the, this allows us to, to interact with the data. All of a sudden we have like a fork or a, a stick and we can interact with it here. Um, my colleague Ephraim Schott is moving uh, one of the original photos through the figure in order to make to to, to compare whether the figure looks as the photo of the original, mm. which it does. <laughs> so, so what we use for, for this uh, special uh, HFR 360, we develop special glasses with Volfoni, which are able to uh, to work in this uh, multi-view environment, and uh, the tracking system that Alexander was describing is also done with a, a German company called I, I, ART, which is quite leading in the same. So what you don't see yes. here is on the side, there are special cameras that basically track uh, at any point of time the shape, mm. of, uh, the unique shape of each of the of the trackers, actually. So it's a bit, uh, uh, as I think, it's like imagine reindeers, which have different uh, type of horns. Basically, you yeah, can identify learned. because none of them has the exact same position but of course it looks a bit uh, funny one of the nice things i find in in using steel 3d glasses for those who have never tried is that it's a bit like wearing uh, sunglasses in the dark uh, but what is i find pleasant compared to hmds is that you are not really immersed in your own world you can still see the people around you that wouldn't be possible to do multi-view uh in a in a advanced cave or even on a 
on a power wall like this one if you were really totally immersed because you would basically bump into uh, the two other Perth all the time. That doesn't happen when you have 3D glasses. You still see clearly that there are people next to you and you mm -hmm. you don't you don't basically bump into each other. So that's kind of comfortable. Uh, yeah, you see yourself and yeah. The amount of light that's coming from the projection as well, um, it Absolutely. kind of fills the room point. with that. So yeah, definitely. Is, uh, so it helps with not bumping into other people. <laughs> um, but the but the glasses are quite um, unique. I've never seen them before in any other um, you know 3D kind of environment. So to see because it's you know it looks like a normal pair of of, of 3D glasses, except they have these points these three uh three points on each side that kind of place the person in space and feed the glasses right so there's a connection between um the projector which like we can see it in the you know um um Aditya, uh, pavilion yeah. that you can see the, the little camera it's it's not obvious at all but I, you know i look so i see it um so it communicates with with uh, with that um, yeah, and absolutely. You, you and might that. want to the beginning of the of the video because there you see how they work. Actually, yeah. So here you basically see that they are they are putting on their glasses, and all of a sudden on the screen you see different images for each of them, how they move. And once I put the glass also on the on the camera, then all of a sudden this camera sees only the the corresponding perspective. That's the whole idea. But Thierry, uh, apologies for interrupting. No, 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 absolutely. no, no. That's 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 exactly. This is not the exact same glasses we're to talking about, but the principle is absolutely what, what you describe. And uh, and now, right. it, interesting, you use a pointer. So as you can see, basically the pointer uh, here uh, works as uh, as a viewer. Basically, uh, it's identified uh, as well. So so this is interesting. And and looking for uh, into the future, you were showing the. Um, the um, basically the tabletop uh, application or or, or or the what I could call a, a well military is called as a sandbox. It's giving a, an idea that I do believe, and it's been hardly done. I mean, you've done some experiment, but few people have done. You can imagine in the nearest future that you can have in this case three people or up to six, actually up to six people six, that yeah. can walk around the table that is absolutely. Uh, uh, lifelike, I would say, the content where you can see if it's a geo application, you will be able to see the mountains, uh, the height of the different things from top down, like looking at a map. Uh, and you can move around and basically, depending on where you are around that table, the image you will see will be absolutely correct. So imagine all that can bring exactly like we see now for several uh, users. But I also believe that this requires to have tracking of every single participant, which is more complex, more, more expensive as well. But I do believe that out of the multi-view, we could see fairly quickly some more uh, museum-friendly application where instead of having tracking, yeah. exactly like Alexander was saying, you could separate three groups of people who are basically sitting... Well, quite close to each other. Imagine a Viking ship, basically, that's being projected uh, onto the mm -hmm. floor. And then you will have three groups of visitors, the one in the front, the one on the left, the one on the, on the right. And each of them will be able to see a view of that Viking ship, which is mm -hmm. correct. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's going to be quite magic. And then if you basically put them quite close to each other you don't the viewpoint is quite close so you don't need to have a tracking system and that will make make it less expensive but you made me think alexander that this should have been already implemented in cinemas because a cinema is audience is quite wide so you could instead of just having 3d shown the, the same image to everybody when there's going to be like 30 meters distance from left to right which is definitely not the same perspective you could at least separate uh, the cinema mm. uh, into three, uh, I would say, three uh, categories. Uh, Zones, uh, and, yeah. and each of them would have basically a more correct uh, 3D view, uh, which already would Im improve a lot uh, the dynamic and the, uh, the, 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 yeah, the, the impact. So there's many things we're going to, we could see actually. Uh, That's a 
that's out a, of that Thierry, museum. Thierry, that's a great business idea. Please pursue that. Uh, we'd love to see that happening in real life. <laughs> at least, at least, museum might be a. Uh, the cinemas, uh, let's say, some other rules that apply that that prevent uh, uh, even innovative companies to get in. I would say at this stage, but I think museums could create cinema experiences or entertainment parks using that concept. Actually, yeah. Mm -hmm. And but but looking at this table, um, just a little bit of looking at this table, uh, we need to have the glasses on to 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 see what's happening. We need to have the glasses with this with the with the point with the, with the six points on them, the tracking. Yes, yes. And of course, uh, in order to make that, that video, this is a 2D view we are, we are having. So it's already quite impressive, I find, in 2D. Uh, uh, but in 3D, uh, it must have been even more, especially when you, when you zoom in. It's absolutely yeah. spectacular. Um, and it's an interface, a tactile interface. You're, and it works with your glasses. It's the whole thing together is just kind of spectacular but um sorry um alexander you were you're talking about something no i just wanted to add 3d is interesting because i think the in all fairness most people have never seen good 3d uh, almost every, and that's why there are a lot of of uh, misconception or or saying well 3d i've been to the movies i've so, i've seen a, a bad sorry to say but uh, yeah uh, animation movie where there was no really uh uh, 3D effect. If I remove my uh, my glasses, you know, I could almost see a, a one 2D picture. Well, a lot of that is based because either uh, there have been remastered copies of, of animation movies that were in 3D, and then they say, okay, yeah. let's make a 3D version of it, so we we're, we're gonna make more money. Uh, or it's also intended not to have a 2D because it, it can be strained for the eyes a too demanding actually a 3D movie because it has to fit all people but I think those who have had the chance or who can go uh, in Lausanne will really see if not 3D at its best but close to because 3D is in a way fooling our brain because we don't yeah. have the capacity to see all of the images the way they are being presented to us uh, so in a way we are fooling the brain but on the other side until now with 3D and even with HMD, you can't, you can't fool the eyes because the precision level uh, of our eyes is absolutely fantastic. Even for those who say, I don't have a good sight, because as Alexander has shown and seen, if you put even a high resolution, uh, uh, basically display in HMD at very close to your eye, you will see all the pixels. You will be able to see everything, which is why it's a limitation today. You won't get the textures look good, look good because our mm. eyes are so fantastic in a way. So in a way, 3D is, uh, we are fooling the brain and at the same time, we can't fool the eyes. Yeah, but but we're, we can't, I mean, the brain fools itself, um, you know, from a neuroscience <laughs> perspective. Um, we fill in the blanks. It, it fill in, it, I mean, it, it, we, we do that with everything. We do that with the room around us. We do that with every with everything in our lives. So, you know, you guys are already kind of using that neuroscience trick where you know brain kind of fools itself um so yeah um but the more you look at something the more you observe the you know the easier it is to trick the brain into not seeing all the textures and all the pixels so i can i can see yeah you're pretty right and one thing that this uh, work that that uh, uh, sarah caroline started really make me think that until now you know on this uh, we're discussing a lot of technology and how basically uh, technology serves the art. But to some extent, I would like to see in future how maybe this multi-view demonstration that was made in mm -hmm. Lausanne will inspire the more creative side of artists into using multi-view for artistic purpose. That That is still a fairly unexplored uh, field. Great. Yes, and then I have questions about how we can do this into multiverse and you know the 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 metaverse and and all that stuff. So um, I want to get to that that conversation, but I think that Alexander wants to show us a little bit about um, telepresence. Oh yeah, I mean basically, if you think about it, um, one thing is um, to be able to 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 show uh, this high resolution data. Um, to multiple people at the same place, but of course, um, often, more often than not, the experts that you really want to have explaining what you see are not in the room. 
Mm. So, um, so in this case, um, I believe it's, it's interesting to include um, external partners or external participants um, in some sort of telepresence. Here's a very early prototype that we did at the university um, with uh, 3D capturings of, uh, of a person. So this is Stefan Beck um, at the end, uh, at the back of this, um, of this virtual space. He's standing there this with a the black shirt. Um, okay. And these are three copies of him, actually, all all, cop uh, all captured in 3D as a uh, uh -huh. as a video. As However, the, the big one is live. <laughs> yeah. And um, and yeah, this is the one thing that we you can e nicely do with these projections um, because you only wear these glasses, so actually, it's it's the people can be captured quite nicely uh, and 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 uh, and shown in these environments. However. Um, I do see that not everybody will be able to have an installation like we have it in Lausanne. We are currently working towards implementing something similar in a in a larger uh, library here in Thuringia um, for for a longer time um, to enable mm. ex public access to such um, to, to such uh, systems. Um, but <clears throat> we do see that for many people, what is accessible are these um, like these these lightweight headsets and what we try to do is to combine all that and that's where the metaverse probably comes in uh, where you say okay um maybe um we have nice data and we can look at it but again the expert is not in the house oh this expert may, might not have a similar system um in his lab so he can um so he cannot join as a telepresence avatar but he should be able to join maybe with his smartphone with his uh with his um with his um hmd or whatever is available or think about the other way you are going to a museum you see something extremely extraordinarily interesting and you want your to invite your friends your family to join this and you just want to send them a link basically to the to this application and this requires us um to deliver the same quality of data you know via the internet mm -hmm. and that's a much more challenging thing that we are currently working on as a company this is looking at uh, at, at, the, at the church of gernrode um which has a um which has um uh, which also has a copy in it it's another deep fake if you want so inside there is you can just uh, leave this um uh, running um okay. in, inside this church there is uh, a copy of the uh, holy um of the holy grave um which has been uh, I'm, i would need to lie to tell you when it has been built um but this is in the in the Harz Mountains in Germany, and inside there is this uh, copy of this holy grave, which is originally, of course, um, not not in Germany. <laughs> um, <laughs> and all of a sudden, we can experience it virtually. Here's my colleagues Andre and Stefan uh, uh, visiting us it, it with it, with their HMDs. Um, and we can also make this possible, say, for desktop computers and so on. But still. Um, what I believe is uh, really the, the the important point to create um, um, to create events, to create social events where you want to visit them. My feeling is that everything that is con constantly available, like all this interesting information in the internet, we don't look at it if there is not an appointment getting us there because there are always appointments where we need to meet people we want to meet right. people and when, if we don't have an appointment we rather lay back um so um if we and this is the point where the museums and the larger installations come in place um where we can say okay and in, in a museum in the library we can create special places where you can appreciate the data at much higher resolution, at much higher quality. Yes. And the technology from DP is uh, enabling this. And this creates moments where people gather around the art that is shown there. And they might want to invite somebody from ex externally. And at, at that very moment, it might be interesting. Okay, if there's somebody looking at the data in, in Jena and he's currently there and he wants me to meet, um, mm -hmm. then, okay, I now put on my HMD. Why not? Um, but um, but I wouldn't probably do it just, you know, just to look at it myself. 
Is it, um, are we talking about something like this? Yeah, like this. Uh, this is data show that we show in the in the deepfakes exp um, exhibition in, in in Lausanne. This is uh, the Otto Tumber, so it's the grave mm -hmm. of um, of Bishop Otto, uh, and here it's me, um, you know, um, trying to explain some of the damages that we see that has been captured at high resolution, um, mm -hmm. starting to to illuminate the data which nicely has been um, reworked by Arctron to add, um, say, material information so that we can render it with uh, physically based rendering. And um, and yes, I don't, I mean, it's, it is definitely interesting to simply put on an HMD and to be able to appreciate this, this data and this artwork at this high level of quality or to use it more professionally, for example, for a damage mapping here in, in a restaurant might want to do damage mapping and can do that on the on digital thing. But again, um, when do we do this? And I do, and I believe we do it when we when we have the chance to meet other people who are currently looking at it. And these mm -hmm. events are probably rather created in museums and at the site um, than they are, you know, we, 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 it's not like television. No, <laughs> clearly not. But you're also talking about applications um, in archaeology, like, uh, for example, um, Martin is talking about layers, um, and you can't look at that as a photographer, like a, as, a, as a photograph, you look at it in, in a scan, it kind of, you can peel layers back, probably, right? Um, so it makes it more interesting to look at uh, an archaeological, uh, archaeological site through time like that, uh, because you can peel one layer, you can look at specific time period, you can peel two more layers, you look at another uh, time period, um, specific, uh, you know, um, completely di uh, different um, time period. So what are the applications you're thinking about for the technology? Because um, what we've seen so far, it's, it's cultural applications. It's we're talking about, um, you know, uh, cultural sites, we're talking about archaeology, we're talking about um, um, scanning um, ultra high resolution um, sculptures and 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 things, but what other things do you think um, we can you know we can expect from this technology? What what are the implementations? Where do you guys see them? I, th I think uh, I think ten years from now we're going to be looking back at where, uh, what we've been doing and say, uh, wow, uh, you know that. That's where it started, or, or basically that was on the right track. The same way then, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, 486 processor was like wow back then. You know, yeah. uh, that's that's just evolution. That's how technology works. But I am convinced that all this this uh, high result, all this precision and the interactivity and the uh, all will be at some point uh, uh, put into some form of. Uh, head-mounted display or, or a microchip, whatever, on our retina or whatever. That, that will happen. So we are just basically having the... We have created the basic ingredients of something that will be, co be quite common 10 years from now, undoubtedly. Yeah, I agree. I mean, this is already happening with these HMDs. I've sh shown it uh, multiple times already. Um, they are more. They are more available. I mean, people buy them for five hundred euro or whatever, and um, and just have them at their homes, and they can meet in the metaverse. Uh, but what mm. makes it not so much interesting is that the data that they can experience there is very low resolution. It's really. Um, it's it, it, like visually. Yeah. It's um, like if you consider what Thierry was telling uh, about our eyes, what our eyes are capable. And then it's like okay, and we're showing this. <laughs> yeah. um, so we should. So um, this is where we try to put a lot of effort into it, being able to show also um, better quality on HMDs, um, just by put, getting the data through it, also through the internet, um, which already works quite nicely, and you know it, it becomes more usable. But application-wise, um, I, I like your question because for us, it's um, I must I must admit it's an existential question. Um, mm -hmm. All this art um, field is I, we love it. You know, we put a lot of our free time into making this possible um, for to be able to to uh, to show these artworks uh, at yeah. a level as you 
how you never could deserve, perceive them earlier. So it's basically honoring the artists from yeah. back then, the, the prehistoric artists uh, in the Pitotti figures, and the, and them, and, you know, and the more um, um, two hundred years Renaissance old recent, yeah. Renaissance things or Rococo time in in, yeah. in Bamberg. It's more Rococo. Um, so we try to 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 do them something or to, to uh, yeah to to be able to honor what what they did. Um, however this is uh, it's not so easy to um, to gather finance financing for these developments because right. of course in the art world there is not not too much money um and in the and, and even even less so in the field of restoration and and, and maintenance um where we also work uh, closely with uh with restorers for example mm -hmm. who like to use the technology to be able to um um, to do damage mapping, as I as I, as I said earlier, yeah. however, they cannot afford buying any of these systems. Even software-wise, it's a bit difficult. So, what we try is um, we try to team up with uh, companies uh, who um, who have different application fields. And I want to mm -hmm. mention here, particular the company Infralytica. It's also a Weimar-based company. They are civil engineers. And they, for one side, they also in, uh, interested as we are in the essay in, in in the restoration part of historical mm -hmm. buildings, and they do a lot of capturing in that regard. And and we then present their data and to to enable damage mapping and stuff like this. But they also uh, look into um, more uh, so more relevant. It's it's hard to say more relevant fields, right? Because culture is of course relevant. But, financially um, viable maybe like this um, and and these fields are bridges and yes. dams and basically the whole infrastructure we are living it and also um power lines all of this data is uh step by step being captured in high resolution and 3d in order to um to enable uh, their more frequent inspections um mm. currently if you want to inspect a bridge um you basically you need <laughs> you go there and in, in in order to to inspect it you need to close it you know what it yeah. means to close a bridge <laughs> yeah so and uh and and then and you know you have when that happens right yeah exactly so um Currently, there are still legal issues why we cannot uh, we, we cannot enforce this yet um, to to do this. Uh, but but even on the legal side, people are working to 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 get policies in place that um, that the data can be inspected more often digitally. And so basically, the idea is we develop technologies that um, that will fit this purpose, but we can develop it in the cultural sector. Um, because interestingly, the engineers that look for cracks in the um, uh, on the infrastructure, um, they need they do not need um, higher quality than the art historians and the um, and, and the restorers. So basically, we what we see is that the archaeologists, the archaeologists, the the uh, the art historians, the um mm -hmm. the restorers they what they are demanding is um is really the best we can get them because the they see solution. in every detail they see something and yes. if we are able to provide them something and that works for them then hopefully we can um also use it in the infrastructure sector and uh, this will um allow us to continue this work mm. makes perfect sense and in terms of technology um especially in the framework of the fixed artist double this is one of the highest tech um installations we have um and it wouldn't be possible obviously without the collaborations between the three companies and and some other very interesting people that you guys have kept mentioning um but it's it's the highest point in, uh, in in terms of of rendering um technology um we have other things um, in there as well that um do phenomenal scanning of all kinds of weird objects little um, objects and then they um you can you can 3d project uh, 3d print after that uh, replicas that look almost as good almost indistinguishable from from the original even at the the, the you know millimeter um uh, uh, scale but um it, it, 
technology here is is a way of enhancing art and it's it's helping tremendously the museum side um like you were talking about um to see the detail to see the the tiny little um oh there's a crack right there there's something sometimes you cannot see this you have you know as a creator as a as an art restor restorer um it's 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 different to look at a piece to constantly be able to look at a piece because you don't have access to that piece all the time um so having this kind of uh, environment where you can actually step in and and look at the piece um without it the, the actual it, art, artwork being there, it, it, it gives a level of freedom um, that is, is unparalleled. So um, for that alone, thank you. Um, <laughs> but the, but uh, so uh, what's next? What do you see this? You're talking about infrastructure. Do you see this um, being brought into the metaverse? Do you see um, avatars being created uh, in this kind of format, um, Thierry was talking about um, the movie industry as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I think the combination is that multi-view can be used uh, in a more creative uh, manner by artists. Mm -hmm. I'm convinced about that, the principle. But also, on the other side, the satellite MLS concept, where basically you can create very large uh, images out of uh, fairly small projection head that people are going to wonder where is all that where is that coming from all that image that light can be uh, quite quite exciting also on the creative side and we are I'm currently talking to some artists who in visual arts who basically uh, like the idea I mean getting the money to make it happen will be a, more of a, a challenge at least for some of them but uh, to be able to use it in a creative uh, way, definitely they, they see that already. So yeah, it's going to be uh, interesting to see and visual arts are, uh, are increasingly uh, appealing to uh, also the younger generation. I think it's very important, both when it comes to museum, we should not forget, like Alexander said so well, about the artists of the past, you know, and their work, but it's also uh, increasingly important to get the, the new generation to to come to museums to experience and basically to at times uh, use their mobile uh, devices to in an interactive way but uh, for most of the time to kind of put them in their pocket and forget about it for a couple of hours and pay attention to other things so finding the impossible right balance uh, uh, is a challenge and uh, definitely still uh, images uh, uh, is a way to attract uh, this younger crowd. Yes, and, and it's it's about the visitor, yes, but it's also about the next generation of creator um, because now seeing that you have this kind of technology available, um, you know, an artist can come in and say, oh my God, I can actually create so much more in this space. So um, having the opportunity as an artist to create with the help of technology and also with technologists to help, uh, you know, uh, to, to create something with the help of art, um, it can come from both directions because, uh, it, and, 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 and that's kind of the, the beauty of, of what's happening at uh, Pavilion, City Hall Pavilions, is this blend of art and science um, come together like, like you've seen in, in this spectacular installation of, of, of the um, Saint Michel um, Abbey in, in Bamberg. So, um, I'm, I'm Alexander and TAD, um, Give us some closing thoughts. Give us some um, some vision of the future that you guys are uh, exciting to see happen. Yeah. Thierry, what do you want to start? No, I, I I just can't wait to see your next project, Alexander. Honestly, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you you mentioned that you are on a possible library uh, project. That sounds interesting. I think because that will be a, a more permanent way possibly to give access to those those tools uh, to to a wider or larger audience uh, that would be uh, that would be uh, very nice and uh, i'd like to know what uh, sarah caroline will be uh, is up to uh, next time because i think that deep fakes at, at difficult times you know uh, for museums pandemic yes uh, pandemic. has been very successful from what i understand and i can't wait to know what she's going to come up next week <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I'd like to to second this. Really, thank 
to to all to the whole team of EPFL and um, and Sarah Kenderdine to make this possible because for us it's really um, a, a reference implementation. Like this is the first time the whole the, the, the system has been used in the public for 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 a while in a museum like installation. And I do believe that te the technology and specifically the the projection based technology belongs to public places. Um, it's an exceptional um, qu uh, quality that can be delivered, but it's also exceptionally expensive, and it should belong to the public. It should be accessible for for people. And this is uh, really this was the the, the, fir the uh, this is the reference implementation for exactly this this type of um, of, of work. Um, I also like um, your your thoughts about Moni uh, that Monica that you had about like, how can and also at uh, Thierry, how the technology can be used further by, uh, say, creatively by artists and so on. So I do think um, that, uh, like, curation, but also arts is always about the narrative, uh, about the story being told. Um, and art is typically not so much different to... Um, to curation in the sense that we are always re referencing uh, prior work. So the meaning of art is typically a reference to prior work. And this is what these whole uh, digital copies, the digital twins, these deep fakes, what they enable to to uh, to come up with a lot of references and to further evolve this. And my last thought in that direction is uh, to close the circle maybe you have been talking about um say physical replicas um that mm -hmm. we also see in the deep fakes ex uh, exhibition which are impressive um now think about the the, the projection technology from uh, from dp it's actually a lamp it's a smart lamp it's an extremely smart lamp i um, <laughs> know about about this but it's a lamp and um, so you can use it to to illuminate things, and you can use it to illuminate um, buildings. Projection mapping, we all know this, and you can use it to illuminate um, replicas of stuff. And now you can, and you can. We have also seen very nice installations. You know how um, how art dis dissolves into like captured art dissolves into something new. Um, mm -hmm. This is specifically this um, turntable by Sarah and her colleagues. Yeah. It's an impressive Double type tricks. of. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm a big fan of this one, um, and all uh, and similar installations can also be done, of course, with the projection technology from DP. Uh, think about you know you having the actual piece there and illuminating it with um, um, with something that can be dynamically changed and. What I, our eyes perceive is um, is not what is there, but is it's only the light. We don't see the material; we only see the light, and that's this is what uh, digital projection can control. No, that's that's a very good point. And, and Monica, I will add uh, and that whoever is going to be watching that may be coming from a more artistic side mm -hmm. was not there to 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 go in that path or feel that it's beyond uh, what the artist can afford or, or knows, should not hesitate to actually uh, get in touch with us personally, because we will be, I think, very happy to actually uh, uh, help out in some ways, introducing other people or, or giving some advice about what to do with what you have when it comes to uh, either projection or 3D and so on. That, that, that's actually part of the fun thing, is to help other people achieve uh, their, their either their goals or their dreams that's actually what makes uh, our work uh, uh, fun but i think it actually it could help with technology develop with r d as well because you have uh somebody that comes in with a brand new idea for for a way of seeing like the way you know of looking at things and it could help trigger some uh some development some uh Absolutely, and get in touch with us. And uh, if it's uh, not something we know about, we probably know where to point them in to someone else or in another direction. In the right direction. 
<laughs> Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So uh, we'll have all that information. We'll have the three companies uh, links at the bottom um, of of the the interview. Um, but for today, um, I want to say a huge thank you. I know we've been over. It's a bit over the time that that I've I've told you guys we're gonna be uh, for today. But I wanted to say a huge thank you for both of you uh, for taking the time to do this. And uh, again, we're we're sorry that Martin um, Scheich can um, uh, join us today, but uh, he's been well represented. Thank you, Alexander, for and thank you, Thierry, for for uh, for presenting um, the work that Artron um, 3D has done as well. And um, that's kind of all from, from, from me in Lausanne. And I wanted to in, uh, invite you all again and to, to check out Do Fake Sergeants Double, the exhibition that's um, actually ending in on uh, May 1st, 2022. So we're almost there. So um, come join us in Lausanne. We have a couple weeks left. And uh, yeah, uh, like, in, like, like, Ther uh, like Thierry said, hopefully we'll see you guys at the next adventure that Sarah Kennedy is putting together at if you built pavilions or anywhere else on the planet. Thank you, Monica. Thank you guys. Bye. Thank you, Monica. Thanks for having us. Bye, guys. Bye -bye. Thank you so Bye -bye. much. Bye. -bye. Bye.